A very warm welcome to you all this evening, um, especially to uh, visitors to the university. I'm delighted to have spoken with a, uh, uh, somebody from the Tank Museum who's here and with whom we've worked, uh, or our students have worked in the past. Um, everybody is welcome to the events which take place in our gallery. And um, this event is particularly interesting, Dazzle and the Art of Defence. And uh, what the distinguished panel here will be discussing is the role of artists and graphic designers and other creative practitioners um, in the defence of Britain during wartime. And that includes um, activity that took place in the First World War and in the Second World War too. Um, I've been very at pains to point out to students who are very arrested by the material they're seeing in the in the gallery that this isn't um, a celebration of war, but it's actually, um, you know, an investigation to interactions between artists and designers during those periods of hostilities. Um, we're very, very um, pleased to welcome to this panel um, a number of people who by lineage are connected with the work of key practitioners, which is shown in this show. And um, Camilla Wilkinson is the granddaughter um, of Norman Wilkinson, who, um, who really initiated the Dazzle Painting um, initiative. And it is an extraordinary conjunction of a very accomplished painter, uh, but somebody who was associated with the Vorticist movement in the pre-First World War period, um, but suddenly sees the translation of some of these ideas into the way in which boats initially, but subsequently other military uh, vehicles, uh, were painted, and not for the purposes of camouflage, but for the purposes of distraction. Um, it, it is an extraordinary... Um, an extraordinary story, which I think Camilla will say much more about, but in my own mind, um, the notion of, or imagine that painter <coughs> in the shipyard on Clyde Bank receiving the uh, instructions about the painting of an enormous, you know, uh, an aircraft carrier or a, or a battleship uh, that would previously have gone out grey now didn't go out grey and I, I just see this moment when the painter is looking at the designs and then looking at the thing uh, about which more in due course. We also welcome um, Naomi Games and um, uh, graphic design students here will probably know the work of Abram Games who was a, a, an extraordinary poster uh, designer and artist. Um, three of the uh, posters which are displayed in the gallery are his work um, and many many others that were part of the great celebration 1951 the festival of britain and then work for london transport it's an extraordinary archive of brilliant graphic design and i know that uh, naomi herself was um, a student at uh, the London College of Printing, I, I should say as was, but as always should be, because um, its name has now changed, but um, at the time of Tom Eckersley, another very significant um, graphic designer. And we have had an exhibition here some time ago of work of that period and by both of those graphic designers. Um, we also welcome Tim Fryer, who's a trustee of the Medmenham uh, collection. A very, very interesting um, a part of our exhibition is the way in which um, visual interpretation, aerial photography, was a very, very important part of uh, the war effort, particularly in the Second World War. And there's a lovely quotation to be seen in the exhibition where Eisenhower, commenting on the work of um, aerial uh, f photographic analysis was worth 40,000 lives on D-Day. The, the precision with which they were able to give to the beaches, which will be the landing grounds of forces um, 
in the D-Day landings. Um, we also have um, uh, uh, Mick Welsh, who um, uh, is our chief operating officer, but has, um, as uh, notes will suggest, a, a distinguished military career himself, and who will contribute to that conversation. Well, that conversation won't have any space until I shut up and go and sit down. So with that, let me just repeat a very warm welcome, a very engaging show here, and one that I know will be very informative to both staff, students, and other visitors. I haven't referred to you yet, as I should do, but um, uh, David Lund uh, was principal curator of this show, and David uh, forms part of our academic staff in model making, and um, it's a very uh, expert piece of curation, David, and I know that you are going to lead the panel discussion, so I now pass to your capable hands. Thank you, sir. So as I don't have to do any introductions, as Stuart so um, wonderfully introduced the panel, um, we'll begin. And when we're talking about um, the role of artists in the defence of Britain, no one else but Norman Wilkinson could really um, sit at the centre of, of such an exhibition. A marine artist himself, uh, who served in the Royal Navy, um, he not only came up with the idea of dazzle painting, but convinced the Admiralty to use it, and brought together a, a, an incredible team of artists to actually be able to put these designs into practice. Um, Camilla, how did this come about? I mean, how did we go from having this idea um, that your grandfather had of um, you know, painting the ships in a way to disrupt their patterns to ending up with literally thousands of ships and civilian vessels being painted in vessel camouflage? Uh, well, I think perhaps um, giving the context for dazzle camouflage is important. Um, so at the time, uh, in 1917, um, the Germans, for the second time in the First World War, had um, declared unrestricted submarine warfare, um, which meant uh, that um, merchant shipping, which was really the only means with which to bring in goods, food, um, and resources for the military campaign as well, um, were able to actually um, feed, clothe, and support uh, Britain at the time. Um, so they were absolutely vital for um, Britain's existence. And um, this unrestricted submarine warfare meant that torpedoes could um, fire at a ship and sink it um, with no warning, no prior warning, which at the time was against prize rules, um, which supposedly allowed um, the merchant seamen to disembark and be taken to a safe place. So there were two, two sort of um, mm -hmm. aspects to um, the, the unrestricted submarine warfare that, that seemed so um, uh, desperate um, for my grandfather and, and many, many people. They were really panicking about the fact that, um, for instance, in, in uh, April of um, 1917, I think it was 60 ships a week were really? being sunk. And if you see, the, there's a map, an extraordinary map, a German map showing all the sinkings of the ships, and it is—it's really shocking. So they were desperate, effectively, to find yes. a way of protecting That's the, right. the merchant shipping. Yes. And Norman was—he was—he was, he was in the Royal Navy Reserve, wasn't he? he That's was actually right. In the so Navy he was—he was—he was, he was on a minesweeper, which is, I think, probably one of the worst jobs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it really, mm -hmm. you know, alarmingly uh, dangerous job. Um, which actually started off in sea crawlers, and eventually, mm -hmm. I think, there were the um, ships. Uh, minesweepers um, built, and he was on one of them. Um, but I can hardly imagine that one might work quite hard to <laughs> find something else to do. <laughs> However, um, strongly motivated. Uh, strongly motivated. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and I, but I, I think it's important to say um, when you say where does this come from? I think um, like as as I imagine the majority of us are designers in here, and and we know that you know ideas come from so many different places. Um, but there was, um, prior to his concept, um, there, there had been you know, many schemes um, that were being tested and trialled. Um, but they were, uh, uh, I'm going to put this very carefully, they were understood by the Admiralty um, to be schemes that were striving for invisibility. Right. Um, which 
could be argued. But um, my grandfather's scheme is the first scheme that, where he said it is absolutely impossible to disguise a ship at sea from the low perspective of the periscope. So that whenever you looked across the ocean, you would always see a ship um, outlined. And before that, and before you even saw the ship, you would see the ship smoke. So you could see the ship smoke from, from I think it was something like 50 miles, no, it was about 50, meet, uh, 50 foot, the smoke could reach up to about 50 foot, but you could see it from more than 10 miles away. Um, and the other point was that, you know, the, the, the submarines knew where the ships were going to come into port. So they always position themselves on the sides of busy, busy shipping lanes where the ships would have to come into port. So ships were very vulnerable to submarine attack. Um, and so his idea was instead of um, trying to make the ship less visible, he said, well, forget about that. Um, we're going to try and distort the appearance of the ship so that it looks as though it's traveling in a different direction. Um, and, and shall I carry on and explain? Yes, so, and the importance of making it look as though it's going in a different direction um, is because a submarine commander would have to calculate um, the size of the ship, um, the direction it was moving in, so the inclination of course, um, and the speed that it was moving at. And in theory, they, <laughs> I'm saying this a bit nervously, in theory, <laughs> um, you use um, a graticule. So you, you would use a gra graticule to um, uh, uh, calculate, carefully calculate, that. However, I believe in theory it was probably done by eye um, because um, a submarine at that, you know, in the very early stages of submarine development, um, when, they, when the periscope came out of the water, even just the periscope wave, um, they would be vulnerable so to be being sighted. They, so they it could be. So there's this very brief period of time, and so the idea is to confuse the U boat commander. Yes to work out, okay, where is this thing going? Stall, stall. I mean, just the stalling time. So that you want, the, you want so the periscope out of the, you know, they were trying to get the commander to have the periscope <coughs> out of the water for as long as possible, mm. so that they, the submarine would be vulnerable. Well, that principle sounds quite simple, in some respects, but we've obviously then got to paint several thousand vessels yes. in these, in the, what presumably are unique designs. So, obviously, Norman's proposed this to, uh, to the Admiralty, and they've given the green light and said, okay, we, we're going to try this, we're going to do this. But he doesn't <coughs> do it on his own, does he? So he has to then no. pull together a team of other artists. But as you were saying before we came in, although these were artists working together, they were really, it was a design job, wasn't it? They were basically becoming designers. Yes, um, and I think what's important <coughs> to consider, uh, the sort of people that he did bring in, so for instance, um, um, uh, uh, Cecil King um, had formerly he'd he'd been working in camouflage in France okay. before he um, was brought back. So I think he was very <coughs> very pleased to be brought back from Western Front, um, as and would, yes. as you would, um, and um, but was bringing back with him expertise of the organisation of camouflage, right. um, and um, and then other artists friends of my grandfather who, initially friends um, of my grandfather who um, probably were, who were marine artists um, and who had the expertise of um, knowing about ships, understanding um, their hull and, uh, you know, the, the actual um, geometry of a ship, um, understanding um, the conditions at sea, the colour, you know, the, so there was a, a level of expertise both that my grandfather had, mm -hmm. which was considerable, um, and and that made it much easier for them to work and understand um, what they were trying to achieve. Well, what the intention was incredibly visible um, sort of statement in the First World War. But to what extent do, you, do we know where the dazzle worked? Um, we know it worked enough for it to be uh, continued. There was a point um, a year after the start, so <coughs> the first ships to be dazzled 
June 1917, and by August 1918, um, actually the Admiralty handed over the Dazzle section, so my grandfather ran the Dazzle sa section, and um, the section was then handed over to the Ministry of Shipping. Um, and I think there was a point, uh, because in fact, he was, he was protecting merchant shipping. Merchant shipping was the primary, uh, that they were the ships being protected okay, rather, than, rather yeah. than the Navy, because the, the naval ships could move fast, so they didn't, they didn't really <coughs> need it. Um, but, um, uh, I've lost my thread. What did you ask <coughs> me? Did it work? <laughs> did it work, yes. <laughs> uh, so, thank you. Um, so, um, that they, uh, in, in August 1918, um, they considered stopping it for various reasons. Um, they weren't sure that it worked. Um, and so they did write a report on Dazzle, and they said, well, it works well enough to continue it, mm -hmm. but most especially, it was the morale of the merchant seamen. Um, it really, they, there were some merchant seamen who, uh, both in the First and Second World War, mm -hmm. would not go out without their ship being camouflaged. So, so they felt, they, so I think you can say it probably worked if the merchant seamen were keen to have their ships painted. So I'd like to, like to bring Nick in here, actually. Now, obviously, your experience is on the land. Yes. People are kept looking at me for advice on periscopes. So I mean, it wasn't I'm advice. <laughs> well, complimenting my knowledge. Between theory and practice <laughs> and what really happens. Now, Dazz is a form of what we then later became known as disruptive camouflage. But to what extent does camouflage in general play a role in the military today? I mean, we'll, we'll think of camouflage and we think of, of the military. Um, you know, does disruptive camouflage have a place, or are we relying on more traditional disguising? I think it's, it, it's a bit of all, really. It might be worth just going back a, a little bit to talk about camouflage. It's a sort of, in basic training, you're taught to put camouflage on from face paint to uniform and uh, to hide yourself, to be able to close with the enemy without being found. And uh, everything was shape, sound, silhouette, even smell. No brushing teeth or washing in the jungle because the smell sits and therefore you're, not, you're, you're more easily discovered. But actually, with the, the, the army got involved from when the point that weapons became uh, more lethal um, and therefore actually standing around in a red tunic on a battlefield became a rather dangerous thing to do. So traditionally, in the Napoleonic period, we had riflemen in green, and they were the only ones who really wore anything that might resemble camouflage. But it was the Boer War when weapons ranges ex uh, exceeded the distance you would close with and kill the enemy that... Um, we started to wear khaki, the British Army started to wear khaki. Although the French in the First World War, uh, they pantanol, they wore red trousers still uh, until uh, probably a year into the, into the fight. Um, but we, we, it wasn't really much more sophisticated that, than that until the First World War. And again, I think it was then when war became an industrial scale that we started to use artists. So artists such as Solomon J. Solomon and others were brought in to paint armoured observation posts as trees to camouflage the movement of tanks when they came in uh, and, and to disguise so many objects on the battlefield so that the, uh, the infantrymen, uh, the poor bloody infantrymen, might have a greater chance of survival. Um, and deception, I think, then became brought in on an industrial scale when it was in the Second World War. Um, a good example, I think, is, is, is in North Africa, where deception was used to camouflage uh, the movement of the uh, Eighth Army when it closed with the Germans in the North, in the North African campaign. And uh, what Montgomery wanted to do was to take troops south into the desert, uh, and, uh, or along the north, well, north, along the north coast, but he wanted to infer that they were going south. So he used artists to create dummy positions, dummy weapons, dummy railheads and so on to allow them to move uh, more easily across the battlefield. Um, and, and today I think uh, camouflage is, is really important, but deception, this ability to, to deceive uh, what the enemy think you're doing is really important. And it's important um, actually to understand it because it's, it's not so much the First World Armies that need it, but those we fight who don't have that technological edge that use it so much. I remember going into Kosovo when we first went in, and as NATO forces, we'd been bombing Kosovo for 90 days, taking out all their infrastructure to try and prevent the Serbian army fighting. 
and I came across sheets of plastic on the ground. And what the servants had done to protect this vital bridge to provide supplies was they camouflaged it with trees, with branches which they'd broken off each evening and repaired. And then they created a wooden bridge next to it with plastic sheeting to represent the road. And every night for 90 days, NATO bombed the plastic sheeting and the wooden bridge, and the main bridge survived, and they could use it. So I think um, it's much more uh, that sort of technical edge, and I think we should very much watch what the others do. ISIS recently, as the caliphate was finally closed down, uh, burnt an awful lot of oil canisters to camouflage their positions from the technological capability. Um, in Northern Ireland, um, I remember we would always look for the absence of the normal or the presence of the abnormal. The thing that makes things stand out or different, disguising what you do, has always been a part of the battlefield. But actually where the technological edge, technological edge is with one group, it's the other group that works hardest to make camouflage work. So the parallels, I think, are there. Um, and I'm interested, so when you say you're not sure whether it worked, that point about it being a totemic thing for the individual is so important to the soldier, sailor, or airman. Well, um, certainly, it's a I mean, talisman. Isn't yes, it? yeah, I think, I mean, that's, that was the British view. Mm. Um, in the US, they, they declared it a success. Mm. Um, and in fact, um, the uh, insurance, shipping insurance companies would not insure a ship that wasn't camouflaged. That's telling. Mm. Yes. So I think it was the British um, <coughs> that, that struggled a bit more mm. with it. Mm. I'd like to change tactics. And Naomi, we've been talking about a very visible way in which we can <coughs> disguise something or distract from something. But Abram's work, which we've got in the exhibition here, is another very visible element of where artists and designers were involved in the defence of Britain. Um, now your father, he, he, he had started a career as uh, um, a commercial artist and producing posters before the Second World War, being enlisted in the infantry. So how did he go from being an infantry soldier to producing this remarkable body of a hundred um, posters for, for, for the military? Okay, my father joined up in 1941 and they said to him, you must go and draw maps. And Abram said that he hated drawing maps. Mm. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he said, you must send me to the infantry because um, I need to go and fight like everybody else. And um, it's a war that I want to fight because uh, he was Jewish and he was a Londoner and he didn't, you know, he, he didn't want to just sit in an office and draw maps. Um, so they sent him off to the infantry, to the Hertfordshire Regiment. So everybody's always referring yes. to him. <laughs> I should continue to do so. And um, he was there for a year, and he got summoned um, to Whitehall, to the war office, and they said to him, we see that you've been a commercial artist. There was no such term as graphic design in mm -hmm. the 1940s. That happened later, late, uh, early, late 40s, it happened, the term originated then. Um, and he, um, they said to him, we need a poster designing. You're, you're an artist. We've looked at our records. So um, go and go and work on this um, poster. And Abram set up an, uh, a studio in the war office, in the attic, and proceeded to work on the first of 100 posters he did in the army. And um, he, um, he had, because he'd been an infantryman, and he'd been in the barracks, he had seen that the posters on the walls were not working very well. They, were, they weren't posters, they were little black and white diagrams. And he had submitted, while he was in the infantry, a memorandum. And he had suggested that what was needed was posters to do with security, health, um, looking after weapons, ammunition, and this was received and ignored. So while Abram was at work in the war office designing maps, he eventually had to do that, 
and posters. Um, he said, look, I, I wrote a memorandum a year ago. Can you go and find it? And they, they dug it up. And they had, they, he had proposed two pages of A4 paper saying what the army needed were these brightly colored posters that the soldiers would look at and would appreciate. And um, he was given an unprecedented free hand, and that's why his work is so amazing, because they didn't interfere with him. They didn't know what they were getting, and they let him get on with it. And he produced, he, he, he did everything for the poster. He did all the research, he did all the, all the slogan writing, the copywriting, um, the artwork, he oversaw the printing of the posters. He did everything. He was a one-man band. Did they reject any They did reject some, and um, not very many. Not very many, and some were not printed. You've got one in, in the exhibition of um, Knit, Knit Now. And there was a war going on in Japan, and, and that's what it was saying. But, but he produced one for Japan um, in 1945, and that was never published because the war had ended. So, so there were a lot of posters that were not used. Um, and can I do a plug here? Um, and in, um, in April, on April the 5th, there will be a major exhibition of my father's work at the National Army Museum in London, which is in Chelsea. And it will show some, it will show everything he did during the war. So it's all 100 against my display? All 100, except okay, so. one I cannot find. I don't know why I cannot find it. So we're going to have a reproduction. <laughs> and and his a lot of sketches and, and um, work that was rejected. I don't think they were rejected. I just think that they were ne they didn't have any call. And so most of his work was in for internal consumption by the army. Mm. Um, but he did also produce posters <coughs> to advertise the army. Can you tell me about this the the, the blonde bombshell ATS um, poster which we have on here? It's probably one of the most famous wartime posters. It wasn't. Altogether uncontroversial, I'd say. Have you seen her? If you go and have a look, she's very pretty. But she's too sexy. Um, she was she was discussed in Parliament for five weeks. <laughs> there was a war going on and the bombs were dropping and this poster was discussed. And they said that um, she, that girls shouldn't wear lipstick. Which was ironic, really, because girls had to wear lipstick in the army when they were producing am ammunition to, and makeup. They had to wear cosmetics to protect their skin. So it was very bizarre. And she looked too much like a, a glamour girl, a prostitute, I guess. And um, she was banned and pulped. <laughs> so actually, that poster there is, is, is a reproduction. I have an original. And there will be an original in the National Army. <laughs> and do you feel that his wartime work was sort of given the, the appreciation that it deserves, the, the, the importance of his, of his work? Um, you, you mean then or now? Well, both. I mean, I think obviously now, in retrospect, we look back and we, we, we appreciate these things from a more artistic and design perspective. But obviously, he produced this enormous amount of work which was so useful for the army. And it was, they, they were, they were they're not frivolous messages, they were very serious messages to improve particularly the health and um, the cleanliness of, of, of the soldiers. When, when that work finished, did he feel, gosh, yes, I'd done something, I'd done something I was really, really proud of, and did he feel rewarded for that work? He was made in, in um, 1942, he was made the only ever official war poster artist. Norman was a war artist. No, no he, was fact, he wasn't. No, no, he was never a war, an official war artist, actually. Right, well, Daddy had the accolade of being official war poster artist, oh. but I cannot find a record of it. Oh. So I think the boss said to him, well, now you're official war poster artist, and I think and that was that. And he always, I mean, he was. I mean, there was, hasn't been another one. There have been war artists. I think there were 400 war artists but only one poster artist. Um, he was very proud of that. Um, 
But then he went on after the war and, and, and he did other things. He did, as, as you said, he designed the Festival of Britain single. And anyone involved in the festival was, was made. And Camilla Norman was recognised several times for his contribution for his effort in the first world, wasn't he? And uh, OBE and... Uh, <laughs> yes, that's... Yes. Um, he was awarded the um, a financial um, uh, prize, which, or prize, but he was, he was given a financial award for inventing Dazzle, although that was quite controversial. I think there were a number of people who... Um, was there a patent? Um, well, there wasn't, no. Um, but you, if, if you had worked during the First World War and, and invented something, um, it was a, 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 a sort of an inventor's award, um, but it could be for a bullet or, a, I mean, for anything, any kind of work that you'd undertaken that had prevented you from doing your civilian work. Um, you could apply uh, and be remunerated for yeah. that. Because Abram was employed by the army. Yes, yeah. So on the flip side, Tim, turn to you now, because these are very visible and publicly, um, or publicly visible ways in which um, creative people were involved in defence of Britain. But now at Men Menham, there was a lot of creative work, there were a lot of creative people involved. This was kept utterly top secret at the time. Um, the Central Interpretation Unit, set up in the Second World War, it grew out of a private area of photography um, company at its, at its nucleus. When it was set up, though, what, what was the Central Interpretation Unit trying to do? What was, what, was the, what was the ambition of using photography and then later um, model making? Um, in before the war, the um, MI6, the Secret Intelligence Service, perceived the need to find out more about what was happening in Europe, particularly obviously in Germany. Um, and they contracted a rather dubious Australian called Sidney Cotton to start taking surreptitious <coughs> photographs over Germany and there's all sorts of stories about that which we haven't got time to go into. But actually one of the people who started working with him just as war broke out was a chap being there for us, his surname was Longbottom so he was obviously named, nicknamed Shorty. So Shorty Longbottom wrote another memo from a junior officer that got its way up and he said right the future way of doing reconnaissance is to fly high and fast because in the first few months of the war the old bomber aircraft like the, the Blenheim um, they were getting shot out of the sky left right and centre so it was very unsuccessful whereas Cotton had managed to get a hold of a couple of Spitfires and they were unscathed and doing a really good job and the core of the people doing the interpretation were some early aerial surveyors at a set up in Wembley um, and they were a, a mixture of, well, they were mostly uh, mathematicians, so the sort of people who ended up at Bletchley Park, that sort of uh, you know, top-notch uh, mathematical types, um, but they took to this game of photographic interpretation. Um, I would like, having been a photographic interpreter, and now we call them imagery analysts because it's not just photographic, um, uh, I would like to describe it as an art. And the sort of people who took to it were initially these surveyors, and then they started getting people in with particular expertise. They were desperate to know about railway systems, so they went to the London North East Railway and said, anyone just about to join up? And there was a, a young chap who, who, who was just wanted to do his bit for the army, do, do his bit for the war effort, and he, for the rest of the war, was the expert on the railway systems of, of Europe. And as they attracted new people in, they would either get them because of a particular expertise, or they get bright young people in, fascinating backgrounds, a lot of them artists, you know, from the slave, that sort of thing, who were you know, in their twenties, wanted to do their bit for the, for, the, for the war, and they managed to have people with feelers out of the place, finding out people who were going to be good as photographic interpreters. One of the best summaries of that sort of person um, and Nick almost touched on this, it was people with a curiosity for the unusual. And talk about the camouflage, it was people who would be looking at something and think, hang on, something not right there. And they would very quickly, because they had the benefit of a bit of time, a pilot whizzing past would very often be fooled by the camouflage. A photographic interpreter who would, armed with 
simple stereoscope like this and millions and millions of prints running off from all the sources, um, they would be looking through and camouflage would very, very seldom uh, fool them. Well, I'd actually say that w the Germans never successfully hid something from us. But of course, if they had successfully hidden something from us, we wouldn't have known that. <laughs> but actually, a lot of the interpreters were so dedicated, so deeply um, involved with their subject areas that they became the national expert. Okay, they might have somebody in Whitehall who is officially the expert, but if the people in Whitehall had any sense, they would defer to the image analysts who were actually seeing the evidence on the ground in the photographs. And a lot of them were able to go to Germany and, the, and the, the rest of Europe and visit the sites that they've been looking at for years and years um, with their, their photographs. And they confirmed when they got there that, ah, yeah, we got that, got that. And there was very, very few, if any, surprises there. They, they did find it all. And so by the end of the war, we have over 100 model makers working at their yeah. end. Yeah. Perhaps you could explain why on earth are their model makers suddenly there? Yeah, very early on, and actually was part of the camouflage unit um, uh, at Farnborough, um, they started making models because as the, the, uh, as the forces wanted to start doing various operations, they thought, right, okay, maps are fine, but actually we need a bit more information, we need to visualise it. Well, I think as Nick said, you know, that ability to visualise quality of maps and things was great, but also having the benefit of, of a model was, uh, was fantastically useful to them. And uh, David's researched some of the characters that came in, but some yeah, absolutely world-class sculptors, architects, uh, and so were, again, doing their bit for the war effort, and said, all oh, right, set you up as a, as a model maker. Quite controversially, early on, the Air Force, who were given the role of looking after the photographs and, and doing that interpretation, they made the model makers, I think it's pattern maker brackets architectural as their, their trade, and they were very poorly paid, but they didn't, well, they minded it to a certain extent, um, but they realised how what a valuable job they were doing. By the end of the war, they were on a bit of a, an extra pay band, um, and they actually call it, admitted them that they were, were, were model makers. Um, but they got on with the job in, in, in with a huge effort. Um, you've listed the number of models, but uh, it's, it's, it's 1,400 jobs came in, and a lot of those jobs involved multiple, multiple model, models. And they were working 12-hour uh, shifts, um, really engrossed in their job. And some of the records that we've got, um, uh, amazing facts like, when they wanted the dam busters model, and that was part of the Air Force wanting to do that mission rehearsal, that they have a more accurate model of the dams, so we can actually visualise how we're going to approach. We can measure bits that are going to be where they're going to check mm -hmm. on the, their position, measure the distance between the towers, which is important to the, the dropping point. Um, but those models were made in five days, and they were made by Americans as well. Part of the, the, the history of, of Medmenham is that the Allies came in very early on um, and were totally integrated. Um, not I don't know, but President Roosevelt's son was in charge initially of the, the US Army Air Force's reconnaissance effort. He was very anti, the, they, or he wanted to set up a, a US headquarters. But actually, the American ambassador was instrumental in saying, no, actually, you, I, I know the work that you've done at Medmenham, come and join in. And the model makers which came over from the States, again with that sort of fascinating background and really, te really technically highly qualified, um, they were totally integrated. So they happened to be on shift with the Air Force people and they made, well, they were part of the team that were making the Dan Buster models and a lot of <coughs> models that were just for the Brits. And the Brits were making models which were mainly for the, for the Americans. Um, it's interesting you referred to it, mm -hmm. about interpretation as an art as well. Mm -hmm. and you know, all through the war, we see these very creative people um, joining them, Madam. I think this is the wider point I wanted to put to you, that beyond the direct contribution of artists, designers, and what we might call today the creative industries, is creativity itself, in its broader sense, part of defence? You know, is there a creative act taking place there? Or at the very least, does success in defence require creative thinking? Oh, I think it absolutely does. Um, 
Uh, you might not regard me as the best example, but I think that creativity is absolutely essential, always has been. Uh, always the ability to outthink the enemy, always the ability to deceive the enemy in some way or other. We still uh, teach our very junior soldiers to make models, the sand pit, sandbox model for when they're going on patrol with hills and curves and so on labelled. Uh, it's really important to able pe people to visualise what they're going to do and what they're going to see. We still have war artists. We have people who come and paint what soldiers are doing on the battlefield. Represents their courage. That's important. That's transmitted back home, and it's a historic record as well. But I think I think the the we're at a tipping point now. I think what's absolutely fascinating is that, of course, it's not happening necessarily in the visual spectrum. It's happening in other spectrum. For example, if you can. Uh, if you're guiding a missile at a target, if you can persuade that missile that its GPS, it's, uh, the positioning system is 50 meters out, that missile will miss its target. If you do that for every missile that's powered at you, no missile will hit you. And that's the sort of technological fight that's going on at the moment. So creativity in using what's out there. Um, we were able to follow the Russian movement, troop movements, as they invaded uh, Ukraine through the mobile phone signals of their soldiers. And I noticed in the papers yesterday, Putin had just decided that Russian soldiers were not allowed to carry mobile phones. But it's a great cry, isn't it? But if you imagine how many mobile phones are in our prison, that's a pretty difficult order to give out. So across the sort of non-visible <coughs> spectrum now, there is so much more going on where creativity is absolutely essential. Disguising the heat signal of a tanker ship or a, uh, uh, an aeroplane absolutely vital to the survival of that piece of equipment. Hiding from radar, um, or hiding from, from remote cameras, uh, the vision of drones, or the use of swarm drones, which are actually used already, which gives you ability immediately to fly a number of drones into an urban area and have a three-dimensional model on a computer of what they're looking at, which gives you a much better ability to find the enemy. So technology versus non-technical means, such as simply burning oil canisters in the desert to hide your position from aircraft, means that I think creativity is an absolutely vital part of the military, and perhaps not always in the most obvious ways. There's still a place for artists, there's still a place for models, but there's still a place also, I think, for people who come off our VizCon courses and, and other things where you need to actually be able to show uh, and, 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 and make new models where you can visualise uh, the areas you're going into. And we do that already. So if you're probably taking a special forces mission into a particular area, you might create a 3D imagery that you can follow and identify a routine. All of that requires really creative people. Which means I kind of going to say to you, because what Nick's saying was this sort of arms race of technology versus trying to hide. In the Second World War, Norman was asked to do a bit more work with camouflage, but this wasn't with ships, or this was more with no, buildings. It was the, yes, <coughs> it was um, as air conduit, yes. Um, he was um, uh, overseeing the camouflage of airfields uh, and buildings, mm -hmm. and I think um, amongst them was um, Windsor Castle. Oh, really? <laughs> really? It's quite um, hard to hide there. <laughs> <laughs> I think he tried to make it look like a farm. <laughs> well, was this because effectively you couldn't apply? Dazzle in the Second World War in its original form because no, we weren't relying on visual uh, yes, spectrum again. Right. So except, except I think what was interesting was that um, I think what was interesting in a way what's interesting is that um, Dazzle camouflage towards the end of the First World War mm. had actually um, in some ways picked up on aspects of um, invisibility. So that, um, not really invisibility, but um, <coughs> enabling ships to look more distorted. Um, so when my grandfather, because it, because in fact it was secret. It, I mean, Dazzle was secret. No one understood what it did. Everybody was confused because they kept saying, why do they keep painting ships <laughs> you know, black and, in black and white stripes or making them so highly visible? How can that hide a ship at sea? So mm. people simply didn't understand what what the aim was. So after the war, you had to keep explaining uh, what, what the idea was, um, the concept. But um, he did take on the fact that um, if he would paint, they would paint the first um, the one half of the ship a sort of grey-green and the um, aft would be um, a sort of 
uh, blue um, with the idea that at least one of those would, would merge into the background and other bits of very highly contrasting shit would then pop out mm -hmm. and create this distortion. Um, but I mean, there were many, many devices because obviously one of the problems with camouflage is once your enemy has understood what you're doing, you've lost the yeah, game. Um, so in a way it had to be constantly reinvented mm -hmm. and um, I think what was interesting was Everest, um, Everett Warner, um, mm -hmm. an, an American um, camoufleur, um, camouflage artist, um, he took one element of dazzle and developed that and then my grandfather actually developed another, the striped version. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, Everett uh, discovered through explaining to the America to the ministry, he had to explain, you know, how how dazzle worked, and he got his ship like this, and he sort of cut it up like a cake, and twisted it, and then repainted that so that it was just completely distorted, and then he realised what he'd done. It was sort of through the make, and we all do this, but it was through the process of having to explain to someone else what he was trying to do, that he actually really discovered what, what he was trying to do, <coughs> and really understood it geometrically. Because before that, he's written about, he'd written about it off the wall, before that they were kind of playing around with devices, visual devices of distortion um, and illusion, but not really fully understanding it. Um, and so the ships that you see that look very, very three-dimensional, very, very twisted and warped, are probably Everest Warner. And then my grandfather's version went on to sort of these patches of colour and the stripes. Um, and then they put the really the most extraordinary designs, the ones where the two come together. Um, and you get the stripes and this extraordinary geometrical distortion. They're, they're the most sort of exciting ones. But, but come the Second World War, it, it turned more into disruptive, disruptive camouflage, where really there was much more of an element of trying to get the ship to be less visible. Yeah, I didn't particularly answer your first question about the secrecy of Medvenum, but actually one of the how much of a conscious decision it was, but Medvenum, which is a very imposing, um, ch whitewashed, chalk building overlooking the Thames, they didn't attempt to camouflage it at all because they knew that if they did camouflage it, then it would have been an indication of how important it was. Um, and very briefly, the, one of the um, people whose job was to look at um, uh, decoys, they did a survey of the different German industrial areas to see where there were most decoys, where there was most camouflage, where there was most effort, and that found the ball bearing factories, which were one of the most important industrial bombing uh, actions during the war, because they were looking at where the where that the second thing was. Yeah. Well, that well that touches in yeah. some ways upon the failure of Dazzle, um, yeah. to some extent, mm. in that it was the ships, you know, it was the larger ships that were dazzled, mm. dazzle painted, and it was the British ships. Um, and for instance, I think it was um, there was a big question about whether the Swedish ships should be dazzle painted. Um, so the Italian, the French, um, um, Japan, the Second World War. But they, um, the, the ships that were dazzled were the ones that were targeted. So that when in the dazzle and convoy, the convoy system, so that's where ships would all um, sail together um, and protected by um, the navy. They all that, which was really the most successful. That was really successful. Um, <coughs> uh, when you saw a couple of if a couple of them were dazzle painted, they were the ones that were targeted because they were sure to be British. Mm -hmm. Ah, I see. So, final questions for all of you. Really, we've talked about this sort of connection between the creative disciplines and, and defence. And as Stuart quite rightly put in the beginning, we're not celebrating this connection. We're reflecting on our own creative disciplines involvement in what were periods where the whole nation was mobilized to defend um, this country. But particularly with the sort of the iconic imagery of both Abram's poster work and to Anon's work in Dazzle, I wonder whether the panel feels that this contribution of, of artists and designers to defense has been as widely recognized as it should be. 
in our in, in our area, there's quite a lot of good accounts of it. But um, I think the there is um, there's still lots of stories to tell about some of the exceptional people who were who were working there um, and their backgrounds. And it brings me to think about what might happen if we were in similar circumstances, which they you wouldn't be, as to how many bright young things would want to then go and do their, their bit and um, completely change tack and have an incredibly rewarding um, little career um, with, in the military, um, or an agonizing period. I was reading something recently of the the, the accounts that many of the women particularly uh, had at the end of the war when they suddenly realised their hands might have been a bit bloodied by what they were doing. And so there was a lot of, lot of heartache there as well. There's a lot of personal um, satisfaction and some absolutely amazing stories there. Absolutely. I think that's really important, that reflection aspect of this exhibition. So to look back respectfully and somberly and not just admire the artwork, but admire the <coughs> dedication that people put in. And that this work was, this was not commercial work. This I, was for a vital, vital role. I think in my father's case, he, the, the work, his work left a legacy of producing work for the power of good. Mm. And he, he never joined the commercial world. He did post his for London Transport because he had to earn some money. But he, he, he believed that the poster the poster that he designed during the war that had a message that, and um, taught people and gave information was a very important tool. And I think that legacy has, the posters are produced, were produced, they're not produced anymore, sadly. But um, not good posters and movies. They're not effective posters. But, the, you know, you can just think of the AIDS poster that, uh, the famous AIDS poster, and um, he did posters for VD. Then he, he introduced posters for health and and important subjects. And I think that was his legacy. I'd like to think that's his legacy. There are some instances where they do posters. The people involved with the mm -hmm. I don't know, still called psychological operations. Um, one example that I, I know about is that. They wanted to do a poster in Afghanistan to try and persuade young children not to pick up ob objects which were explosive devices. Which and is the poster they initially did had a, sort of an elder sister telling a younger boy, "Don't do that." And then they got, and then then they had their bit of advice, and actually that didn't go down very well. So they had to do an elder gentleman telling the young boy what to do because they was touching a sensitive area there. Yeah. You know, they've got to, you know, it, it, you've got to well, really hit the spot with these things and get all the political uh, correctness or political incorrectness right. They had psychologists working in the war office mm. and, and a lot of Abrams posters, he had to fight to get them through because the psychologist said, oh, you can't do that. Yeah. He said, yes, you bloody well can. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're rapidly running out of time, but there are, you know, we have a short period. If there are any questions that the audience would like to ask, any of the panelists, we can take can, one or two. Can I ask a question? Of course. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you mentioned that um, war artists still go out in the field. Mm. Why? Now, why do they? Why? Because we've got photography. Mm. Why? Why do we have war artists now? I think we still, as a military, you know, as a, as a nation, record things in paintings. Um, I think that it's still an important part of the, the ethos rather than um, for morale rather than for anything else. I think, uh, although I did find that uh, when I first went into Pristina in Kosovo, I found a, a parachute regiment patrol all frozen to the spot, looking really alert, and I, I thought there was a problem, so I went up to see, you know, what, what's happened, and they found a Kosovo who could paint, and they all stood there, so he could paint them, so they could take a picture of them with them. So. I think even the soldiers quite like it. So, um, but I, can I just finish? Because I think it's it, uh, the, the, bit, the bit about this ability to visualise as a military person, the ability to visualise. Uh, when I ran the Army Star College, you know, history was integral, and uh, I had a wonderful professor called Richard Holmes who sat alongside me, advising me in terms of military <laughs> history, and led all the battlefield tours. And we still do a lot of them because seeing it and visualising what it's going to mean means you're better when you when you go into it. 
And we did use posters in Kosovo, we used posters in Afghanistan for all sorts of reasons, to, to some greater or lesser effect, depending whether we actually understood the social environments we were going into. But still part, an integral part of the armory. Time for one last question. Is there anything from the audience anyone would like to ask? Um, you touched on um, the legacy that, that the posters, um, that sort of technology has had. Do you think that that's going to become a lasting legacy, both within the military world and in a more commercial sense? And this is especially with the, the Dazzle ships. So I just uh, yeah, wonder well, if that relates to the radar. Of, yeah, well, I think Dazzle has... Um, uh, really become uh, its own culture. I think there's a whole culture around it, whether it's um, you know orchestral maneuvers in the dark, uh, naming their album after it and, and the music. Um, I mean, there are so many, uh, there are buildings, there are all sorts of dazzled um, interiors, all, all sorts of people fashion. I mean, I'm wearing Maharishi top, which is so worn out, I patched it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing it, it's such a drop um, You know, so, uh, you know, Maharishi have their Wilkie shirt. Um, you know, they're, they're, I think it has spawned a lot um, of, of um, fashion, music. But um, at the time, immediately after the war, I think after the First World War, um, I think it was Frederick Etchells who, who described an exhibition, there was an exhibition of uh, paintings uh, of, of, from the First World War, probably, <coughs> probably with some Wadsworth um, black and white prints of dazzle ships. And he did say, you know, it was one of, it was one of the bright spots of the war, you know, that the dazzle ships were one of the bright spots of the war. So I think, I think they seem quite humorously actually, when you read the press, Afterwards, I think they were seen to be quite a sort of, um, although not, you know, the, the, the reason for them being dazzled was serious, but I think they were seen to be quite sort of exciting. Yeah. So huge, we, we, I mean, they were so anyway. big and they were in the middle of London. I mean, seemed to be doing something. Yeah. I think that was really important when casualties were so high. So. Yeah, but we don't, we don't see, it's, I think it's quite interesting because we don't see ships in the UK. We don't really see ships in harbour in the way that you know the, the harbour of London you know, was in London. So lots and lots of people would have seen seen them and and around Belfast, Glasgow, Newcastle. On, on the wider legacy side, and I I, I know people who who retired and job is doing lots of battlefield tours, and that that is a it's a bit of an industry. And I think the engagement of the younger people at school and how much is in the curriculum, I don't know, and um, the, uh, the military ish museums, their engagement with children and these STEM programs that I think all the forces have run. I think there's a, a lot there. Some of it might, uh, people argue, dumbed down a bit, but. Uh, yeah, it is on the curriculum. Yeah. <coughs> Which is the power of this, you know, an exhibition like this, the intention is to use the visual qualities of this amazing work to connect us to some very important issues in our own history. Can I congratulate you on the exhibition? <laughs> it's really, really, really interesting. Your exhibition and again students. starts. <laughs> 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 it reminds me of your exhibition of um, Abrams' work. Yeah, Abrams' exhibition is starts on the 5th of April at the National Army Museum. And there's a book to go with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just what will this is the first copy. It's, it it um, will come out. So this actually has all 100 posters. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Everything, everything, including including um, working drawings and sketches. We could only fit three in the exhibition, but we could fit all 100. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And if I were to your act, I would the, the, the wife of one of our trustees who hasn't got a military background but was helping in our archive, uh, women of intelligence, it's not only an account of the, the world that I've been involved with, the photographic interpreting, the, it's not only an account of that, it's particularly an account and the first hand reflections of the, the, the fabulous characters just happened to be female, um, who were, were involved uh, in, in, in that. It's, it's really a fascinating read and the contribution they gave. Thank you.
If I might just add, Tim, I think what is <coughs> potentially very interesting too is that work in this area of aerial analysis, and if you take Bletchley Park, the gender balance was very much more equal than in other er other theatres, and um, I think that's quite quite, oh, quite important. I think we pride ourselves, and people who have looked at this academically, that, that <coughs> Mebbenham was even more gender blind. They were people in charge of sections and, and things throughout the, the, the war that who were, were, were female. That happened to be female. And you um, have a female designer yeah. in yeah. Eileen Evans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they were just out of harm's way in the UK. A lot of the interpreters who went out to North Africa and other places. Um, they, they, they were feedback as well. Mm -hmm. We could certainly mm -hmm. talk about all these issues for, <laughs> for days and weeks. Um, can I ask for a round of applause for our... <laughs> Jim, to make a few special thank yous. No exhibition appears without a huge amount of work. I uh, really would really especially like to thank Elisa DeRosa, uh, my co-curator, for her dedication and coordinating what has been an enormous amount of work for this exhibition, and to the staff and the students who contributed work, thank you very much indeed. To the gallery team who installed this, to William, Taris, Paul and Georgia, thank you. And of course to Violet McLean. The uh, creative force behind the gallery is Artistic <laughs> Iron has added so much to this exhibition, and if there is another war, I think she'll be one of the first creative people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. thank you all for coming this evening. I'd like to also formally like to thank David for chairing the panel this evening. Yeah. echo and thanks to Elisa De Rossa and I'd like to stand up so everybody knows who she is. So Elisa, can you please stand up? No. With that said, please carry on the conversation over a glass of wine. So if you'd like to wake me to, we are way to the gallery, please let the conversation start.